On November the 28th, 1787, His Majesty's armed vessel Bounty set sail from England with 46 men aboard bound for the island of Tahiti in the South Pacific. Commanded by Lieutenant William Bly, her mission was to collect and deliver breadfruit plants to the West Indies, where they would serve as cheap food for slaves on British plantations. After a long and grueling journey in which Bly attempted unsuccessfully to round the storm-lashed Cape Horn at the tip of South America, the bounty finally arrived in Tahiti on the 26th of October, 1788. But the voyage and the hedonistic temptations of this tropical paradise soon began to take their toll, and over the five months the bounty spent in Tahiti, morale and discipline among the crew steadily broke down. These tensions finally boiled over on the 28th of April 1789, when three weeks after leaving Tahiti, the crew, led by acting Lieutenant Fletcher Christian, mutinied against Bly, setting him and 18 loyalists adrift in an open boat. The mutiny on the bounty has since become the stuff of legends told and retold in dozens of books, plays, and films. It is history's most famous mutiny, a classic tale of a beleaguered crew rising up against their tyrannical and abusive captain. But as with many such stories, the narrative has become progressively distorted with each retelling, such that the most common versions of the story differ significantly from the actual events. Popular retellings also tend to leave out what happens after the mutiny, which is in many ways an even more fascinating story, and one which had consequences which continue to resonate to this very day. Nearly all versions of the mutiny on the bounty paint William Bly as a cruel tyrant, vain, arrogant, willing to mete out brutal punishments for even the most minor offences. The reality, however, is rather different. Though known to be short-tempered and sharp-tongued traits which had cost him promotions on several occasions, Bly was otherwise a consummate professional and a compassionate and conscientious leader. On the bounty voyage, he did everything in his power to ensure the health and well-being of his men, from stringently enforcing cleanliness to prevent the spread of disease to switching from a two-watch to a three-watch system so his men could have eight hours of rest between four-hour periods on duty. He even organized daily dance sessions complete with the fiddler to keep the men fit and entertained and when the bounty spent two weeks fighting gale force winds while attempting to round cape horn bly opened his own cabin to let his men rest and gave them regular rations of straight rum to keep them warm though do note here that as we've covered previously alcohol will actually lower your body temperature not increase it as is commonly thought owing to the fact that it makes you feel warmer while actually doing the opposite. In any event, this attempt, often attributed to Bly's vainglorious desire to circumnavigate the globe, was actually part of Bounty's sailing orders from the Admiralty, and it was Bly himself who decided to give up and reach Tahiti via the safer but longer route around the Cape of Good Hope. And when it came to discipline and punishment, Bly was actually far less strict than the average Royal Navy captain only flogging one man, Seaman Matthew Quintal, for insubordination on the entire outbound voyage. This relatively relaxed attitude can continued once the bounty reached Tahiti, with Bly tolerating his men's rampant dalliances with the native women so long as they performed their duties efficiently. So, what went wrong? Ironically, it was likely Bly's lack of authoritarianism which ultimately led to the mutiny. Over the five months the bounty remained in Tahiti waiting for the breadfruit plants to mature, the men succumbed to the varied temptations of the island and grew progressively less efficient and disciplined. Bly blamed his junior officers as much as the men themselves and regularly lashed out at them, writing in his log, Such neglectful and worthless petty officers, I believe, never were in a ship as are in this. Bly reserved the worst of his wrath for his second-in-command, Fletcher Christian, who he constantly humiliated and denigrated as a damned cowardly rascal. This was in spite of Christian and Bly being friends before the voyage, and Bly having promoted Christian as acting lieutenant over his own sailing master, John Fryer. And in sharp contrast to his angry trades against his officers, Bly's enforcement of discipline among his men was curiously lax. For example, when three sailors, Charles Churchill, William Muspratt, and John Millward, deserted the desert island and were subsequently re captured, Bly merely ordered them to be given 48 lashes each when any other captain would have had them hanged. Such inconsistencies and contradictions only served to bewilder and agitate the rest of the crew. Further adding to the tension was the fact that Fletcher Christian, son of a well-to-do family from Cumberland, belonged to a higher social class than Bly and chafed at having to serve and be humiliated by his social inferior. According to author Glenn Christian, a descendant of the mutineer, Christian may also have suffered from a mental illness known as brief psychotic disorder, which includes brief periods of irrational behavior. By the time the bounty finally left Tahiti on April the 6th, 1789, she was a powder keg absolutely waiting to to blow, needing only a little spark 
to set her off. That spark came on April the 27th in the form of a dispute over coconuts. Discovering that his personal supply had unaccountably dwindled, Bly angrily accused Fletcher Christian of theft. A heated argument ensued, at the end of which Bly cut the crew's rum ration and angrily stormed to his cabin. For Christian, this indignity was the final straw, and he set about trying to desert the ship and head back to Tahiti. However, midshipman Edward Young convinced him to take over the ship instead, and early the next morning, Christian and a small gang of armed men burst into Bly's cabin, tied his hands behind his back, and dragged him up on the deck. The mutineer's plan was to load Bly, his clerk, and two midshipmen into the ship's launch, and then set them adrift. However, Bed misjudged the extent of the crew's disloyalty, and over 30 men volunteered to join Bly in the launch. This was eventually whittled down to 18, but the launch, built for 15 men, remained dangerously overloaded. The men forced to remain aboard the bounty pleaded not to be counted among the mutineers, to which Bly responded, Never fear, lads. I'll do you justice if ever I reach England. What followed was one of the most extraordinary sea voyages in history. The mutineers left the loyalists with five days' food and water, as well as the captain's log, a compass, a chronometer, a sextant, and navigational tables, but no charts, which Christian kept for himself. Thankfully, the loyalists could not have asked for a better man to lead them. Bly, something of a navigational and mathematical prodigy, had been chosen in 1775 at the age of only 21 to serve as sailing master on Captain Cook's third and final voyage of exploration. During the five-year voyage, Bly had mapped much of the South Pacific himself, allowing him to navigate the bounty's tiny open launch largely from memory. Bly first made for the nearby island of Tafua, readily visible by the plume of smoke rising from its active volcano. There, he hoped to secure additional provisions for the long voyage ahead. However, the loyalists were soon attacked by hostile natives, resulting in the death of quartermaster John Norton as he attempted to cast off the boat mooring line. The rest of the loyalists barely managed to escape by throwing pieces of clothing overboard to distract the pursuing natives. Wishing to avoid a repeat of this encounter, Bly made the bold decision not to stop at any other islands and instead head straight for the island of Timor in the Dutch East Indies, a journey of more than 3,600 nautical miles across the uncharted Coral Sea through the Endeavour Straits between Australia and New Guinea and through Australia's Great Barrier Reef. The journey was a long and harrowing one, the tiny launch sitting dangerously low in the water, constantly threatening to sink as she was hammered by frequent and violent tropical storms. Provisions were meagre, with each man receiving a daily ration of only an ounce of bread and a half pint of water. A fishing line was trailed out, but no fish were ever caught, though several birds were caught in the launch's sail. During the voyage, the loyalists became the first Europeans to sail through the Fiji Islands, though they dared not land for fear of cannibalism. Bly, ever the inveterate navigator, managed to fix the island's position so accurately that his figures were later used in official admiralty charts. After a month of hardship and privation, the launch finally made landfall on a speck of land in the Great Barrier Reef, which Bly dubbed Restoration Island. Over the next four days, the loyalists sailed from island to island in the lagoon, gathering mussels, berries, and other provisions before reaching Cape York at the northern tip of Australia and turning southwest. The following eight days were some of the hardest of the entire voyage, pushing the men to the brink of collapse. But at last, on June the 12th, 1789, 48 days after being cast adrift, the Bounty's launch and her exhausted crew of 18 sailed into Kupang Harbor on Timor. As Bly later wrote, it is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessing of the sight of this land diffused among us. The mood aboard the launch during her harrowing voyage is a matter of some debate. While Bly later claimed there was no dissent among the crew and that he kept their spirits up with stories of his adventures sailing with Captain Cook, according to Sailor Master John Fryer, quote, Bly was as tyrannical in his temper in the boat as in the ship, and his chief thought was his own comfort. Supporting this account is the fact that several standoffs occurred between Bly and the other men during their crossing of the Great Barrier Reef, the two sides threatening each other with cutlasses. And despite the hardships he and his men had endured, upon reaching Kupang, Bly maintained a stubborn adherence to the protocol, insisting that a makeshift Union Jack be made and hoisted up, and that John Fry remain on board the launch to guard her. Of course, none of this takes away from Bly's achievement, which is still certainly one of the greatest feats of navigation in naval history. Unfortunately for many of the loyalists, this epic feat was to prove all for nothing. Shortly after arriving in Kupang, botanist David Nelson succumbed to fever. He was soon followed by seaman Thomas Hall, quartermaster Peter Linkletter, master's mate William Elphinstone, seaman Robert Lamb, and acting ship's surgeon Thomas Ledwood. In all, only 12 of the 19 men set adrift by the mutineers, Bly among them. 
made it back to England. When Bly landed in England on March the 14th, 1790, he was initially fated by the public and the press as a hero. He was formally court-martialed in October of that year, but the Admiralty Court found him blameless in the mutiny and honorably acquitted him of all charges. Based on Bly's testimony, Fletcher Christian was stripped of his rank and discharged from the Royal Navy in absentia, and in November, the frigate HMS Pandora under Captain Edward Edwards was dispatched to Tahiti to capture the mutineers and return them to England to stand trial. Pandora arrived in Tahiti on March the 23rd, 1791, and within a few days, Edwards managed to capture 14 surviving mutineers, imprisoning them in a specially built 18 by 11 by 6 foot wooden cell on the ship's quarterdeck, dubbed, inevitably, Pandora's Box. After five weeks in Tahiti trying to determine the bounty's whereabouts, on May the 8th, Edwards set off to scour the thousands of South Pacific islands for signs of the renegade ship and her crew. The search turned up nothing, and on August the 29th, 1791, shortly after abandoning the search and setting course for the Dutch East Indies, Pandora ran aground on the Great Barrier Reef. As the ship began to founder, Captain Edwards ordered three mutineers released from Pandora's box to help man the pumps. When it became clear Pandora was doomed and Edwards gave the order to abandon ship, Armourer's mate Joseph Hodges and Boson's mate William Malter rushed to Pandora's box to unlock the remaining prisoners' shackles. Before they could finish the task, however, the ship sank. Four mutineers and 31 of Pandora's crew drowned in the disaster. Ironically, it is Captain Edwards who most closely fits the profile of the incompetent, despotic leader so often attributed to Bly. Not only did Edwards show little regard for the welfare of his captives, imprisoning loyalists and mutineer alike, and callously leaving them to drown when Pandora sank, but in his single-minded pursuit of the bounty, he ignored smoke signals coming from the island of Vanikoro. These were later determined to be from the survivors of a French Lepreux scientific expedition which had disappeared three years prior. It was not until 1825 the remains of the shipwrecked expedition members were discovered on the island. The Pandora survivors piled into four open boats, and in one of history's strange parallels, essentially retraced William Bly's grueling voyage to Timor, arriving in Kupang on September the 17th. The ten surviving mutineers were imprisoned and transported home on a variety of ships, finally arriving in England on April 5th, 1792, aboard the British warship HMS Gorgon. The court-martial of the bounty mutineers began on September the 12th, 1792, aboard HMS Duke in Portsmouth Harbour, presided over by Vice Admiral Lord Hood. Testimony was provided by the survivors of Bly's open boat voyage, and after six days of proceedings, the Admiralty found six men, Thomas Burkett, John Millwood, Thomas Ellison, William Muspratt, Peter Hayward, and James Morrison guilty, and sentenced them to death. Hayward, Morrison, and Muspratt, however, managed to use family connections to obtain royal aprons, leaving the less well-connected Burkett, Ellison, and Millwood to be hanged from the yard arm of the HMS Brunswick on October 28, 1792. And there, the matter rested, the Admiralty considering the muti an extraordinary one-off occurrence not worthy of further concern or action. The rest of the bounty's crew went on to live more or less normal lives with Peter Hayward, even acquiring the patronage of Lord Hood and rising to the rank of captain by 1803. But the fate of the bounty herself and the mutineers who had sailed off with Fletcher Christian remained a complete mystery, one that would not be solved for nearly 35 years. As to this, the sun, it was once said, never set on the British Empire. At the height of its power, the British Empire covered nearly a quarter of the Earth's land area and ruled over 23% of its population, making it the largest empire in human history. While today the empire, per se, is long gone, the United Kingdom retains enough overseas territories that the old adage still technically holds true. One key link in this global spanning chain of British possessions are the Pitcairn Islands, four tiny, wave-lashed specks of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. First spotted by European sailors in 1606 for nearly two centuries. The four islands, Henderson, Ducey, Oneo, and Pitcairn, attracted little attention. However, on February the 6th, 1808, the American sailing ship Topaz, commanded by Captain Mayhew Folger, dropped anchor off the supposedly uninhabited Pitcairn, only to discover a curious community of people living on the island. The inhabitants, mostly Polynesian and mixed-race children, spoke English, but had apparently never seen a ship before, and among their number was one John Adams, the last surviving bounty mutineer. From Adams's testimony, Folger and the British Admiralty were at last able to piece together what had happened to them after the mutiny. After setting Bly and the Loyalists to drift, Fletcher Christian and the mutineers set out in search of an island on which to settle. While many wished to return to Tahiti, the islands by now had become a regular stopover for British ships, and was Christian knew the first place the Royal Navy would come looking for them. Instead, the bounty sailed to the island of Dubai, 300 nautical miles south of Tahiti. Unfortunately, the mutineers were immediately met with hostility from the native population, leading Christian to establish a fort on the north end of the islands, bombed with weapons from the bounty. After two months of bloody skirmishes with the natives, the mutineers finally gave up and sailed back to Tahiti, where 16 men decided to remain ashore. 14 of those men would later, as noted, be captured by HMS Pandora. 
By this time, relations between the mutineers and the Hedons were beginning to sour, and Fletcher Christian did not intend to linger much longer on the island. Knowing, however, that he and his crew would need women for any future settlement, on the night of September 23rd, 1789, Christian invited a group of Tahitian women aboard the bounty for a social event, then ordered the crew to cast off and set sail, trapping his guests aboard. After dropping off six elderly women on the nearby island of Moria, Christian, along with eight mutineers, six Tahitian men, twelve women, and a baby, set off once more in search of a remote, uninhabited island where they could escape the long arm of the Royal Navy. Christian found an ideal candidate in the log of one Captain Philip Catteret, commander of the Royal Navy sloop HMS Swallow. On July 3, 1767, Catteret sighted a small, uninhabited volcanic island some 1,600 nautical miles southeast of Tahiti, which he named Pitcairn's Island after the first member of his crew to spot it. Pitcairn was perfect for Christian's purposes. Not only did the violent surf make the island dangerous to approach and land on, but Catteret had miscalculated its position by 188 nautical miles, making the island difficult for pursuing Royal Navy ships to locate. On January the 15th, 1790, the bounty dropped anchor at Pitcairn, and after waiting three days for the weather to settle, Christian and six other men rowed ashore. The islands proved warm and the soil fertile, exceeding Christian's wildest hopes. The bounty was anchored in a sheltered cove, and over the next few days, all the livestock and provisions aboard were brought ashore using wooden rafts. Then, fearing that the bounty would be spotted by passing Royal Navy vessels, on January the 23rd, the mutineers set fire to the ship, sinking her in what's now known as Bounty Bay. Now completely isolated, the colonists set about organizing their new lives on Pitcairn Island. They built leaf shelters and later wooden houses on a site now known as Adamstown and planted breadfruit and sweet potatoes from seeds brought over from Tahiti. By 1793, several children had been born on the island, including Fletcher Christian's son, Thursday October Christian. For a while, the mutineers and the Tahitans lived in relative harmony, but the idyllic existence was not to last. While the mutineers had divided up the land among themselves, they had left none for the Tahitans, sowing deep resentment among the two groups. Furthermore, the Tahitan women, outnumbered by the men, were treated as little more than sexual slaves, being passed around freely from husband to husband. When in the first year of the settlement, the wives of mutineers John Williams and John Adams died, two women, Tufaiti and Tinfania, were taken from the Tahitian men to replace them. The women's original husbands, Tahiti, Tararo, and Oha, conspired to kill the mutineers in retaliation, but the mutineers were tipped off by the women, resulting in Tararo and Oha being executed in December 1790. Eventually, Fletcher Christian attempted to enslave the Tahitians, who retaliated in September 1793 by murdering five of the mutineers, including Christian. The remaining mutineers struck back, and by 1794, all the Tahitian men were dead, leaving only four mutineers, John Adams, Edward Young, William McCoy, and Matthew Quintal, ten Tahitian women and their children on the island. An uneasy peace held for a time, occasionally interrupted by protests from the women at their mistreatment by the men. On one occasion, the women attempted to leave the islands on a makeshift boat, but were unable to launch it. Then William McCoy, who had previously worked in a distillery, discovered how to brew a potent and hallucinogenic spirit from the roots of the tea plants, leading to an outbreak of paranoia and violence among mutineers. McCoy, driven mad by the drink, bound his own hands and feet and leapt off a cliff into the sea, while in 1799 a drunken Matthew Quintal threatened Young and Adams, and was killed in self-defense. Finally, on December 25th, 1800, Edward Young died of asthma, leaving John Adams as the last surviving bounty mutineer on Pitcairn Island. For a time, Adams spent his days drunk on tea spirits until, following one particularly violent hallucination, he underwent a sudden religious conversion. Assuming leadership of the colony, Adams used the bounty's Bible to try and build a more moral, harmonious society. He was greatly aided in this task by the Polynesian women, who used their traditional knowledge to grow crops, fish, raise livestock, cook meals, and craft boats, clothes, and other essential items for the colonists. When in September of 1814, Pitcairn was rediscovered a second time by the Royal Navy ship HMS Britain and HMS Tagus, the ship's captains took pity on Adams and convinced the Admiralty to pardon him for his role in the mutiny. News of the mutineers' fate and the settlement on Pitcairn Island attracted considerable attention across the empire, and British missionary societies began sending Bibles, prayer books, and more practical items like clothes, cookware, and guns to the islands. Whaling ships also began frequenting the islands to trade and reprovision greatly improving the islanders' quality of life. In December 1823, the islanders' gene pool finally received new blood when John Buffett and John Evans, shipwrights from Bristol, arrived aboard the British whaler Cyrus. The two quickly integrated into Pitcairn society and taught the inhabitants woodworking skills, which would soon form the basis of the island's economy. John Adams died on March 5, 1829, followed by his wife Theo nine days later. By this time, the population of Pitcairn Island had grown to 66 and was fast outstripping the island's ability to sustain them. Before his death, Adams had petitioned the British government to allow his people to emigrate 
navigate elsewhere, and on February the 28th, 1831, his request was granted, and two ships arrived to transport the Pitcairners to Tahiti. While the islanders were warmly welcomed by the Tahitians and given land on which to settle, they soon began succumbing to disease and homesickness. The insular and highly religious society on Pitcairn had made the islanders too puritanical and repressed for the sexually liberal climate of Tahiti, and on September the 3rd, they all chose to return home. The islanders would be evacuated again in 1856, this time to the recently abandoned penal colony of Norfolk Island, but once again, a large contingent chose to return to Pitcairn shortly thereafter. Following their return in 1831, the Pitcairners settled into a quiet life of subsistence, growing food and making handicrafts to trade with passing ships. Effectively leaderless following the death of John Adams, in October 1832, the community was taken over by an American adventurer named Joshua Hill, who claimed to have been sent by the British government. Hill imposed a tyrannical and puritanical regime, brutally punishing the islanders for the most minor of infractions. This reign of terror lasted six years until 1838, when Hill was exposed as a fraud and expelled from the islands. Recognizing the need for protection from such despots. The same year, the Pitcairn Islanders drew up a formal constitution establishing a democratic government consisting of a magistrate and council of two members who would be elected annually. Remarkably, the constitution also enshrined universal women's suffrage, the compulsory education for children, the first in the British Empire to do so. While Pitcairn would not formally be declared a British settlement until 1887, the islanders celebrate November 30th, 1838 as the day they were officially incorporated into the empire. The next century and a half were marked by alternating periods of quiet isolation, desperate privation, and occasional strife as the Pitcairners struggled to preserve their unique society and adapt to a never-changing world. While the end of whaling in the Pacific led to a sharp decrease in traffic to the islands, the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914 brought a steady stream of ocean liners sailing to New Zealand, and with it an increased demand among passengers for the Pitcairn Islanders' famous wood carvings and other handicrafts. But Pitcairn's unique history and extreme isolation have taken taken a severe toll on its residents, and starting in the 1950s, reports began emerging of a rampant culture of sexual abuse on the island. In the later 1990s, Gail Cox, a police officer on temporary assignment on the island, began uncovering dozens of allegations of rape and sexual abuse from girls as young as 12. When confronted with these allegations, many of the islanders were dismissive, arguing that the age of consent had always been 12 and that they had never caused any problems. But according to Australian Seventh-day Adventist Neville Tosin, who spent two years on Pitcairn, I think the girls were conditioned to accept that it was a man's world and once they turned 12, they were eligible. They can't settle or form solid relationships. They did suffer, no doubt about it. In 1999, police officers from Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom launched Operation Unique, charging 13 men, a third of the island's male population, with 21 counts of rape, 41 counts of indecent assault, and two counts of gross indecency with a child under 14. The trials began in 2004, and on October the 25th, six men were convicted, including Steve Christian, the island's mayor, and a descendant of the head mutineer Fletcher Christian. The British government set up a prison on the island where the six men served their sentences from 2006 to 2010. Yet in spite of the demons haunting the island, the 50 or so Pitcairners still carry on much as they have for the last 200 years. Their tiny society in the middle of the vast Pacific, a unique and unexpected legacy of the most infamous crime in naval history. Now at this point in the video, you might be wondering, well, what happened to the other central figure in the Bounty Saga, the often vilified Lieutenant William Bly? Despite being fated as a hero on his return to England and cleared of all responsibility for the mutiny by the Admiralty Court, by the time of the mutineers' trial in 1792, public opinion had turned against Bly, and the rest of his career, respectable as it was, would be marked by further trouble and mutiny. Bly was not present for the mutineers' trial, having been given command of the HMS Providence on a mission identical to the bounties. This time, Bly succeeded in delivering breadfruit plants from Tahiti to the West Indies, though, in an ironic twist, the slaves on the British plantation turned out to hate the taste of breadfruit and refused to eat it, rendering the whole enterprise moot. In 1797, Bly was given command of HMS Director, in which he surveyed and mapped large sections of the British coast. That same year, Bly once again found himself facing a mutiny, though this time it was part of a larger uprising across the Royal Navy and not specifically triggered by any of Bly's actions. As the Napoleonic War swept across Europe, Bly was called into action and served with distinction at the Battle of Camber Down in 1797 and the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801. Through the Bounty Saga, and his wartime service, Bly acquired an additional reputation, deserved or not, as a strict disciplinarian, resulting in his appointment in 1805 as governor of the Australian penal colony of New South Wales. Almost immediately, Bly's abrasive personality and confrontational leadership style brought him into conflict with the colonists, especially the New South Wales Corps. The Corps, a regiment of soldiers tasked 
tasked with maintaining law and order, effectively ran the colony like a mafia, engaging in illegal rum trading and other criminal activities. In response to Bly's fervent attempts to curb their power, on January 26, 1808, the Corps rose up in what's become known as the Rum Rebellion, Australia's first, and thus far only, coup d'etat. Troops marched on Government House in Sydney to arrest Bly, who, as popular accounts at the time claims, they found hiding under his bed like a coward. Whether this actually happened is disputed, but a watercolour painting widely circulated at the time helped to cement the legend in the popular consciousness. The deposed Bly returned to England and doing what he did best, navigating and surveying, helping to chart a large portion of Dublin Bay and Ireland. In 1814, he was promoted to the senior rank of Vice Admiral of the Blue, though thereafter he was never again given an important naval command. Bly died of cancer on December 7, 1817, at the age of 63. Despite his long years of loyal service, such was Bly's infamy by this point that his passing warranted only a brief mention in the local newspapers. And so, William Bly passed into memory as one of history's great villains, a reputation greatly polarized by Charles Nordoff and Haymes Norman Hall's 1932 novel Mutiny on the Bounty and its many stage and screen adaptations. But as we have seen, the real William Bly was a far more complex figure than history gives him credit for, more a victim of bad luck and his own quick temper than the cruel and cartoonish villain he is often depicted as. It just goes to show that, as always, fact is more nuanced and honestly fascinating than fiction. And in case you were wondering which of the many film adaptations of The Bounty Saga is the most historically accurate, well, that would be 1984's The Bounty, starring Anthony Hopkins and Mel Gibson. You're welcome. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do use that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Before you leave, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm doing called Into the Shadows. So maybe the world isn't dark enough for you. Well, good news, it absolutely is. And if you'd like to know more about the horrible things that humans have been doing to each other since, well, time immemorial, well, please check out that new channel, Into the Shadows. From landmines to penal colonies to horrific diseases, if it's horrific, we cover it. Check it out through the link in the description below. Again, it's called Into the Shadows and thank you for watching.